Hi everyone, my name is Brooke and I'm a geologist and I'm here on the beautiful island of Iron to look at some of the exciting geology here. Today we're going over to the west of the island and we're going to look at the Paleogene magmatic intrusions and the Triassic sediments that host them. Let's go and have a look. Geology is really cool. Let's go lick some rocks. Yeah! Right, so here's Kildonan over on the west side of the island, and the first thing we've got to do is get there. And that means we get to drive across the spectacular central granite and Dalradian province and see this fantastic landscape that was carved by the glaciers. And there's some trees. Some more rocks. And here we are on the beach at Kildonan. So while Connell geologizes with the students, let's go and have a close-up look at some of the first rocks we've got here. Isn't it nice? Oh. In the last episode we looked at the Devonian Old Red Sandstone. We've now jumped forward in time to the Permian and we're looking at the New Red Sandstone. New Red Sandstone was deposited in similar environments to the Old Red Sandstone, except it's Permian and Triassic in age. So we've moved forward in time and the UK has moved northwards across the equator and into the northern arid zone and you can see from looking at these rocks we've got here that the permian new red sandstone records the same semi-arid environments that the devonian old red sandstone recorded the rocks are a lighter color though this time because they've been recycled from the old red sandstone so they're losing some of the iron and some of the aluminium that gave the old red sandstone its deep red color Check out that cross bedding. And here we can see a contact between two different environments. So we've got the pale caliche, which is an arid environment carbonate deposit. And that's overlain by fluvial and aeolian sandstones. We can see evidence of sandstones and erosion here in these pebbles in this cross bedded sandstone. Like we saw in the old red sandstone, the sediment is eroding itself as it's being deposited in these rivers. Little nice little gravel lag there. We've also got these red mudstones threaded by these wiggly and knobbly carbonate concretions. And these carbonate concretions are, like in the old red sandstone, rhizoconcretions and trace fossils left by organisms burrowing through the mud and probably excreting as well. So we've got another environment here. We've got these mud flat type environments in this area as well. Let's go and look at something different and we can come back to the sedimentary rocks later. This big structure jutting out into the sea isn't a jetty, it's a dike. And a dike is a geological feature that cuts at an angle to the bedding or structure of whatever rock it's intruding into. There's swarms of dikes like this made of basalt or dolerite all over the west coast of Scotland and they were formed in the Paleogene when the North Atlantic Ocean opened about 55 million years ago or thereabouts. If lava gets to the surface then it cools so quickly it can't form crystals and it forms volcanic glass like this pitch stone. We can see that it's got floor banding in it and that's those lines here you can see under all of the algae and lichen and that means it was still gloopy when it was cooling and settling as it intruded into shallow layers or even perhaps onto the earth's surface. Pitchstone's very similar to obsidian but pitchstone has much more silica and water in it. As you can see here the dikes are pretty bloody big. Makes for a Suitably impressive landscape. Nice little waterfall there. So a quick stop for lunch and then some more fun with the local wildlife. Maybe it's not as impressive as the dolphins we saw yesterday, but this is still a pretty cute frog. Hello frog, how's frog business? You ate any good grabs lately? While we had lunch, the tide came in, so where we were looking at the sandstones now underwater. But we've climbed up on top of one of the intrusions, and this one's slightly different. What a beautiful scene. Undergrads! Busy geologizing and eating sandwiches, probably. 
So let's have a closer look at this rock while Connell is educating the undergrads to the mysteries of what they're sat on. As you can see, they're enthralled. The igneous rocks we've looked at previously today have all been quite fine grained, but this one's got some very big grains in it. Can you work out what any of these minerals are? Poor James lost his glove, but thanks to my walking stick, there was a happy ending. Thanks James, that's added some real gravitas and drama. <laughs> These hand specimens really highlight the differences. Look how fine grained this piece of dolerite is. You can barely make out any of the crystal grains in it. But it's got that classic mafic rock darkness to it, and you can see all the iron weathering out of it too. So let's take a look at the stuff we've been sat on and we can see we've got these big pale pink orange crystals there and they're quite square shaped so that's our friend feldspar probably k feldspar something like orthoclase and they're in a ground mass of much smaller crystals and if we could zoom in we would see that there was lots of quartz and tiny plagioclase crystals in there so this is a kind of igneous rock called a felsite bit of a detour now we're back in the Permian sandstones and we've got the King's Cave, allegedly where the King Robert the Bruce hid from the English when he was on the run. There's lots of caves that claim that though. You don't normally get caves in sandstone so what happened here was during the ice age the sea level was higher and it got into a crack probably from a fault and etched out the cave. And then when the sea level fell people started using it and carving things on the walls like these ancient symbols here that are thousands of years old. There's also lots of graffiti in here that's less than thousands of years old. This looks like a dog or a wolf or something, and then next to that some much more modern graffiti. Right, on to the next outcrop, but first just time to give this lovely jiggly cave moss and algae a poke. It was very slimy and like jelly, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Leaving caves and igneous rocks behind, we're back in the new red sandstone now and we've moved forward in time from the Permian to the Triassic. The dimples in this red siltstone are actually fossilised raindrops. You can see current ripples in there as well as essication cracks, which means the sediment was drying out under an arid climate. These pale areas are full of reduced iron and carbonate, so you probably had anoxic conditions there during the burial. And that was probably because they were full of organic matter, so we know there were things living here. Here's some nice modern footprints and current ripples. I wonder if a future geologist will look at them in millions of years time and wonder who we were. This big slab contains traces of some of the animals that were living around here at the time. This thing I'm putting my hand in is the footprint of a creature called Chirotherium, which was a dog-sized animal and possibly related to early crocodiles. Another fleeting moment in time caught forever in the rocks. Lastly, we're going to look at some more of the Paleogene volcanics and igneous materials. This massive structure here is the Kildonan Sill. It's got columnar jointing like the giant's causeway, but it's made of something different. Let's have a closer look and see if we can work it out. And we can see lots of these little oblongs, and that's our friend the feldspars, a beautiful zoned example there. And these are the potassium feldspars that we saw earlier. So it's a felsite sill, not basalt like the giant's causeway. Here's some more dolerite as well, and you can see that the grain size increases towards the middle of the dike. And that's because when magma cools slowly, you get large crystals. And here's the contact with the red Triassic mudstone, and you can see where the hot dolerite has cooked it a little bit along the edge. And here's a nice little treasure I picked up on the beach. It's a piece of the Triassic mudstone, but you can see those square shapes. They're the preserved remains of salt crystals, so we must have been near the sea back in the Triassic. And it was really salty, and as the seawater evaporated, these salt crystals called hopper crystals grew out. But when they got wet again, they dissolved, and then they were replaced by clay and iron oxides. So they're what we call pseudomorphs. Pretty cool. So I hope you enjoyed your second day on Aaron and a bit of a whistle stop tour through the geology of the West Coast. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share and all of that guff so you don't miss out on future videos including more episodes about the geology of Aaron. Until next time, if you've got any questions, put them in the comments below and I'll see you later. Bye bye. Peace out. <laughs>